Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome to Verbal Remedies, the booster shot, the launch event. Um, thank you very, very much for coming. Uh, welcome also to the second Wayward Festival um, and to virtual Aberdeen. Um, I'm Helen Lynch, and I uh, put together this festival together with a rather wonderful group of young people. Um, but I'm also here today in my capacity as convener of the Medical Humanities Creative Writing for Medics course, which all these very kind readers um, have contributed to in their time. Um, and they are also uh, contributing, contributing to this, which they're going to be reading from today. Um, we're very grateful for the overall funding of the festival for the University of Aberdeen and also to Creative Scotland, um, who fund the Word Centre for Creative Writing to, to run the festival. Um, and this particular event also has the uh, sponsorship of Explorathon, as well as the very kind input financially <laughs> and otherwise of Dr. Bob Clark, um, who has been um, funding Verbal Remedies for some time in memory of his great aunt, Jeannie, Dr. Jeannie McLeod, um, and also to the medical school at Forest Hill. And we're also grateful, as Mo will explain later, for some uh, distributory activity by a mental health charity, but he's, he's gonna talk about that. Um, I should mention also that we have Leslie Creera here for um, BSL interpretation today. And you should be able to see her throughout the event, as long as too many of us don't leave our cameras on. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see her right the way through if you need her. Um, and we also have automatic captions at the bottom. So if you want to enable those and you can't see them, you can click on the CC button on your Zoom toolbar and you should be able to do that. Um, so I'm gonna hand you over without further ado really to, to Mohammed Rafe Hussein, who, who was a member of the uh, Medical Humanities Creative Writing class two years ago, maybe. Um, and is now, look, authentically dressed in his scrubs, direct from renal medicine. Um, but uh, Mo was, was a very engaged member of the group, and he also won the REM case prize uh, for creative writing that year. And he unwisely, perhaps, said, if I wanted any help editing the next edition of Verbal Remedies, he would, he would assist. So I'm afraid I held him to that. And it's been a great pleasure to work with him and really a great pleasure to see all these pieces of work. It's a kind of bumper edition this year because, um, because of COVID, we didn't end up having one last year. So it's three years worth of students. So there are representatives from at least three, three cohorts of, of the course here today, and they're going to share their work with you. And I hope you, hope you enjoyed it very much. So I'm gonna hand you over to Mo. And um, if, Mo, I'm just gonna say one thing that we missed in the tech bit. If you put up the slide of the, of the cover, don't put it up, don't say anything while you do, because they won't be able to see Leslie. So just put oh. it up for a second and take it down. It can't sit up for the whole time, because they can't okay. see the, the audience can't see the readers and can't see Leslie if you do that. So okay. they just get a quick, no, it's okay. Give them a quick flash and just, just get them excited about buying it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll put it on. Last expense at the end of run. Okay, I'm going to hand you over now. Thank you very much, everybody, right. for, for agreeing to come. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lynch. That was um, oh, it's a wonderful little introduction. Um, and we want to say, actually, from the students, thank you so much, Dr. Lynch, um, for kind of guiding us um, throughout this whole process. And I, for one, really enjoyed reading these pieces that you're going to hear today as well, and um, whilst we were editing. Um, and we're short for time today, so let's get straight to it. Um, our first reader uh, today is Jia Fei Lao, um, and she's got a wonderful haiku for us, which is quite apt, and um, a short story called Curtains, off to you, Ji. So I'll start with my haiku. I drank the milk, realized it was mayonnaise. Quarantine day five. And next, my creative writing piece. I want to see the stars, the bright diamond shaped things that blink like they're shooting, they're watching me from outer space while I sleep. I want to see them shoot across the sky, the ones that are called shooting stars. Wait, they're called comets. I remember their names from science class. In my textbooks, it says that comets catch fire when they enter our Earth's atmosphere. And that is why they look like they have a tail of light following closely behind them. 
I also remember that Haley's comment, is that his name? I need to look at my book again as I may get tested on this on my exam. Only appears once in almost a hundred years. That is a long time. I wonder, will I get to see it tonight? These questions keep chasing each other in my head as I sit at my long white study desk, the mushroom shaped lamp making my science homework glow a warm yellow. I have to finish this by today so I do not get in trouble with Miss Yap tomorrow. The side of my left hand is already lead black from using my 2B mechanical pencil for too long. It looks shiny and sleek, like the glittery black thing mom puts around her eyes that makes her look like a panda. I pinch myself, so I stop daydreaming. I rest my chin on my right hand as I write out the names of the planets of the solar system in the order of the ones closest to the farthest away from the sun. It is nearly nine o'clock. I'm supposed to go kiss mom goodnight and pack my bag for school tomorrow as I have to wake up at five in the morning. If I forget to bring my homework, I will have another ice moment in class. I call it that because my heart does this thing where it feels like it's turning into ice in my chest. This happens when Miss Yap makes me stand in front of the class on the chair as punishment for not bringing my homework. Even if I try to explain to her that I did finish it at home. Teachers always ask us not to make excuses, but what makes an excuse different from a reason? Is it an excuse when people my age say it because grown-ups do not trust us? Why do they not trust this? I rub the sleepiness from my eyes and look over my homework to make sure I've finished it all. I'm wondering whether I should erase Pluto from the list of planets I have written down. I read in this thick book on that bookshelf that Pluto is no longer a real planet and is called a dwarf planet. On second thought, I put my eraser back down. Although I tried to explain to Miss Yap the other day about what I have learned about Pluto, she said that for the exams, it's still better to stick to the textbook. I try not to ask her many questions because she would say that I am arguing with a teacher, which is disrespectful. She says students should not be arrogant just because they know a little bit more than other people. I think she looks at me sometimes when she says things like that. It is getting late. I brush my teeth with my Barbie doll toothbrush and change into my baby pink nightgown with Disney princesses on it. I put my bestiary science homework book and homework diary into my hot pink roller bag. Just as I'm getting into bed, I suddenly decide to walk over to the window and look at the sky. There are no stars that I can see. Dad tells me it is because of the light pollution in the city. I know it is also because the sun is the only star in the solar system and other stars are too far away to see even at night. The only stars I have seen are from the Peter Pan movie that dad bought from the Pasamala market. An idea suddenly lights up in my head. Who says I cannot camp under the stars like Barney the purple dinosaur does with his friends? Maybe I do not have marshmallows and cannot make s'mores, but I can still sleep in a tent and stare at the night sky. Without wasting a second, I rush to my bed and grab the corner of my blankets. I pull at them until they slide off the bed along with the pillows, making a soft thud on the wooden floor. I drag the blanket with my right hand and pull the curtains back with my left one. How do I make more space for myself behind the curtain? I think of how Barney and his friends set up their tent. They used long poles to stop the tent from falling. I do not have any poles, but maybe I have something to support the sides. I spot the bench at my study desk and lift it quietly instead of dragging across my room so mom, dad, and Jae Eun do not wake up from the noise. I move to the curtains, place the bench next to them, and pull the curtains back across the bench. This way, I have more space to lay my pillows and blankets on the floor. I now have a cozy nest in my tent. Smiling at my work, I switch off my desk lamp and it's as if another lamp is switched on outside at the same time, giving out this white glow that makes everything look quiet. My tent is the only thing that I can see in the dark. Holding my breath, I enter my tent and lower myself slowly onto the blankets. It's not as comfy as I thought it would be. 
I can feel the hard floor even through the blankets, but it is okay because this is what camping is. I look up at the slit between the curtains and the metal pole. My eyes follow the way the cloth flows like a waterfall downwards and over the bench next to me. Moonlight pushes its way in between the metal bars of my window, their shadow showing up on the curtain to my left. I raise my hands, hook my thumbs together, make a butterfly, and watch as its shadow dances in the moonlight. I name it Mariposa after the butterfly fairy in a Barbie movie. I create other animal friends that come alive in my tent, such as Wolfie who howls into the night and Brer Rabbit who hops around on his hind feet. In here, I forget about Miss Yup and her rotan which she loves to whip through the air. I forget about the black and white uniform in my cupboard. Tonight, I remember what it is like to dream and make up exciting stories that never end. The moon smiles like the Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland. It hangs over my head and asks me, what are you looking at? I squeeze my eyes shut. Sleep starts to wrap its arms around me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was amazing. You have an amazing um, reading voice and it's come to me straight down after a hectic day. So thank you very much for sharing your work with us. So next we have um, uh, Karina Chopra. Um, and again, I really enjoyed um, the haiku and the piece music lesson that you're gonna hear as well. Right, off to you, Karina. Hi, thanks, one second. So my first two haikus, every day the same, Eat, sleep, drink, repeat. Eat, sleep, drink, binge watch Netflix. Squished avocados, rotting brown on the inside, makes a sad hipster. This is my short story called The Music Lesson. Crescendo, Karina, crescendo, Sarah's voice bellowed out against the heavy bass of the piano. Keep building, keep it going. No, 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 do not bang on the keys. Let the notes sing. A dissonant noise emerged from the piano as Karina's hands slumped down on the keys. I didn't think I was banging. The markings say fortissimo. Yes, but there's a way to entice the sound out of the keys. Move into the keys, not on top of them. Try again. She waved her arm, a gesture to reiterate the importance of being in, moving into the keys. As if this gesture triggered a reminder, Sarah began making sounds of a sharp scratch as she began scribbling away in the notepad. Karina shrugged and turned back to the piano, making silent movements, whispering under her breath, go into the keys. The haunting sound of Chopin's Nocturne in E minor enveloped the room once again, with Sarah's critiques following suit. Good, move into the keys. Play from the shoulder, maintain evenness. Good. Good, now slowly crescendo. With each note played, Sarah's echo was even louder than the music. Her petite figure etching off the chair through the sheer excitement at the sounds escaping the piano. She's ruining my flow, Karina thought to herself. Slowly now, don't give the dynamics away all at once. Really emphasize that first beat. Karina's playing fill the room with the melodramatic tones of the minor arpeggiated scales her body now swaying along with the music as she moved into the keys. Is this okay? Silence. Sarah? Karina looked out the corner of her eye and saw Sarah totally immersed in the music. She laughed to herself quietly and returned to her gaze to the piano. As the piece drew to a close, the slow, soft sounds drifting away into space, Sarah opened her eyes and uttered the words again. Karina rolled her eyes. Just another day in the life of a music student, she began to play Chopin's Nocturne in E minor for the umpteenth time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corina. Um, you pretty much transported me into that uh, music lesson. So thank you, that was great. Um, so uh, the next reader we have is uh, Connor Hughes, whose work I really enjoyed <laughs> reading over the last couple of weeks. Um, especially the haikus. Um, so he'll be sharing with us a haiku and a, a short story called Uncle Tommy. Go ahead, it's all yours, Connor. Thanks. And we'll just get the haikus up first. 
Everything is cold. My love, electric blanket, how I yearn for thee. That's the second one. Everything is cold. Not enough socks in the world. Do I still have toes? Um, and this is a short story called Uncle Tommy. <clears throat> the only thing left was his eyes. The rest was put on ice, sealed in Ziploc bags, and given away. At 13 years of age, I flinched at this statement from my Uncle Tommy. We were in his house. Five minutes earlier, a passing comment about an old friend of his had started him off. Fine by me. Something to fill the silence till one got out of work and I could finally get a lift home. Oh, Parvius, my uncle began. He was born in Niger like his dad, but his mum was from Fermanagh. I remember the first week he came to school and everyone hated him. The boys would spit at him, call him some seriously racist stuff, even for back then. Until out in the yard his temper would rise and he'd swing for one of them and then 10 of them would jump in. And of course, I thought that wasn't fair, so I got involved as well. I broke two fingers and we were both given suspensions, but it was worth it. I'd made a friend for life, you know? My uncle's eyes darted around the kitchen where we sat. They never settled on anything. It was like the intensity of his gaze would burn a hole if left unattended or unmoved. It was frustrating, but it was the same reason I could never look him in the eye for long when he spoke. Fear of being singed. So we stuck close after that. All through school, both left at 16 and sure we hadn't a clue, but it wasn't until his 21st when it all happened. The two of us were out for a feed of pints and Jesus Christ, if there was one man I couldn't keep up with, it was Parvius. Tommy laughed and fist bumped me. It took me off guard. It was a strange affectation he picked up on the streets of Manchester after living there for several years. He was forced to come home after a drug fueled bender and a stranger's hammer splintered his jaw and left him unable to eat solids for a month. Even after that, he still held on to it. To me, at least, receiving a gesture from a 40-year-old always felt awkward um, and forced, but I always obliged. I was on my ear, so I decided to head home. His smiling face cracked for a second. A hidden grief reared its head, breaching for air. He left the kitchen table immediately and got up to put on the kettle. And so Parvius stayed on and ended up at the Millcroft. Do you know it? I do. The Millcroft was an old people's home just down the road. I had gone there a million years ago with scouts once at Christmas. The whole place smelled of urine and even at eight years of age, I thought, surely there's more dignity left in these people's lives than this. So we climbed on the roof and it's December and the snow's just coming down all day. And he wanted to scare people, right? <laughs> he was always being in Egypt. So we climbed up the drain pipe and tea or coffee. Tea, please. The steam of the kettle was rising now as my uncle sniffed the milk he'd pulled from the fridge. The whole house was a mess. Mold encroached every space on the kitchen that wasn't in regular use. Unwashed clothes lay in mounds on the floor. The air tasted like stale smoke. I hated coming here. So it ended up he was making a racket, all these stupid noises, and did you say tea? I nod. And he told me he must have threw up on the roof and then slipped, cracked his head on a pipe on the way down. His eyes glazed over. You would have liked him, you know? He placed the cup of tea in front of me and sat down with his own. I thought about how to respond, but the good thing about Tommy was he would fill any gap in a conversation, especially if it was him who had blown a hole in it in the first place. They left his eyes because his mum thought he would need them to see heaven. Everything else went. The next year we met a man who had his heart, a 30-year-old something from Belfast. It's nice to think that there's still a bit of parve, you know, still kicking away. He paused. I suppose I should have stayed with him that night. I've never felt a silence so full and thick. Twenty years of guilt surrounded me. I looked into the muddy depths of my tea, wishing mum would pick me up soon. I had a dream about him. The borderline mania of my uncle regained light and sound. I could almost hear his innards whir and click. So in my room, he was sitting there, and I sat down in front of him and said, you know, Parvius, this is great. It's been so long since we've met. And my uncle's eyes dampened. Saying it out loud, he had caught himself off guard. His voice wobbled and raised slightly. But he just sat there, shaking his head. I hope he doesn't hate me. That night before bed, I thought about Tommy and about how some people, no matter how hard, how hard they try, just ache so bad and never stop. I remember thinking about the unfair universe and Parvius. I hoped he could see heaven. I hoped in his brown eyes it looked beautiful. Thank you, Connor. Um, yeah, that was really good.
um, and hearing it as well just adds another dimension to it. And I think it's just, yeah, everybody who listened was very lucky to hear that. Thank you for sharing that with us today. So um, next reader, um, it's Katrina O'Leary, or most of us know her as Kitty. Um, and the piece she's gonna be reading for us today is Ultrasound. Um, so do you wanna go ahead, Kitty, and- Yeah, sure. Take it away. Katie sits down in the old plastic gynecology chair in the radiologist's room, while an array of dauntingly big machines beep away next to her. She peers over curiously when the door clicks open and a woman wearing a stethoscope around her neck steps in, holding a stack of bunched up white paper. Sorry for the delay, we're running late today, she says as she takes her seat in front of the heavy desk in the corner of the room. Oh, that's quite all right, Katie spits out a bit too quickly. So, let me see. The doctor glances down at her sheets of paper. Katie, you're here today for a transvaginal ultrasound. Is that right? Yeah, I, uh, I think that's what the GP said. Okay, would you be able to lay back and bring down your trousers slightly for the scan? And we can have a chat about what exactly has been going on. Now, have you ever had an ultrasound before? The, to the doctor types vigorously on the keyboard in front of her, giving a subtle background rhythm. Katie starts unbuttoning her trousers and brings them down slightly. The plastic of the gynecology chair giving her a sharp chill down her spine. No, I haven't, but I've um, seen them on TV, but only for pregnant women. So I'm, I'm a bit confused. I'm almost certain I'm not pregnant. That's fine. We use them to have a look at a number of things, not just pregnancy. It will involve me putting some gel on this probe. The doctor walks over to the machine stood directly next to Katie and takes the probe from the ultrasound scanner, covering its end with a transparent bag, which I'll put, which I'll then put on your pelvis. It might feel a bit cold. I'll then move it to different regions of your pelvic area, which will give us a picture on the screen here of what's happening internally. It shouldn't hurt at all, but you might feel a bit discomfort. If at any point you do experience any pain, just let me know and we can stop. The doctor places the probe back down while she washes her hands with alcohol gel and puts on a new pair of rubber gloves. The smell of the alcohol evaporating gives a welcome break to the scent of chlorine left over from sterilizing the room between patients. The doctor sinks down into her stool and rolls over to Katie, picking up the probe and squeezing onto it a generous amount of lubricating gel that exits its tube with a little squelch. Yeah, that's fine. Is there anything in particular look you're looking for? Katie asks as the doctor places the probe on her pelvis and starts up with quick circular motions that spread cold gel across her abdomen. A murky gray and black picture begins to bloom across the machine's screen. There is a brief silence and the doctor notices for the first time how prominent Katie's hip bones are protruding from her pale colorless skin. We just want to make sure everything's normal or if there, may, if there may be something going on that would explain your symptoms. May I ask you for a little bit more information about what symptoms you're experiencing? Her eyes wandering from the probe to the screen, squinting at the picture presented in front of her. Well, I've noticed some bleeding between my periods and I've dropped a bit of weight, quite a bit actually. Not that I'm complaining about the weight loss. I've been eating like a pig and getting skinnier. That part's been great, but I just thought it was best to tell my GP, who then sent me here, Katie replies, looking vacantly around the room. The movement of the probe begins to slow from its quick, unorganized motion, morphing into more concentrated circles over certain areas of her pelvis. The changing picture on the screen slows with it as the doctor presses a series of keys and begins taking screenshots. Have you experienced any pain at all? Um, I have actually, it's been feeling like I've been having bad period cramps, but I just assumed it was something normal to do with my cycle or something. There is a brief silence as the doctor's eyes are fixated on the screen. Katie notices the mood in the room shift to something more serious. 
numbers start appearing, measuring unidentifiable structures, then more screenshots, one after another rapidly. Hmm. A low sigh comes from the doctor, quiet and under her breath, as though she didn't intend for it to be heard. But Katie does hear it and her stomach drops. She is no longer looking vacantly around the room, but wide eyed now focusing on the doctor's face as she wipes the gel from her stomach and starts to pack away the probe. Is something wrong? You can pull your trousers back up. That's the scan finish now. The unanswered question lays thickly in the air. Katie's heartbeat picks up and her relaxed smile drops. Is everything okay? She asks again, sternly this time. The doctor's eyes look up from the machine to meet Katie's. I think there may be some abnormalities. I'm going to refer you to a specialist. A specialist in what exactly? Katie demands impatiently. Oncology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kitty. Um, you know, when I was reading this, and obviously when I was hearing it as well, it's very rare to get an insight into um, the um, consultation process, essentially. So I'm pretty sure all the other medics that are listening in here, they were probably trying to work out a differential as we were hearing the story. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, and you know, it was nice to see both perspectives. Okay, next, um, we have um, Madeline Hawkins next, who's gonna be sharing with us a haiku and a really, a really nice short story that I really liked. <laughs> I mean, it's called Salsa Dance. Go ahead, Madeline. Thank you. Um, so to start with my haiku, phone, keys, and wallet, off to the shops together. Damn, forgot my mask. And next is my short story called Salsa Dance. Charlie's slender hand hesitates for a second before grabbing a packet of lightly salted crisps. He places it delicately into the trolley next to a bottle of red wine. James, what else is on your flatmate's list? He calls out to a tall boy with wispy blonde hair who fishes a piece of paper out of his denim jeans pocket. Uh, olives, salsa, and whatever cake we want for dessert, he reads. James crumples up the paper between his hands, smiles, and flicks it dramatically at Charlie's shoulder, who feigns injury. Content with his paper attack, James leads the way, with his hand gently pulling on the front of the trolley. Charlie notices the muscles in James's arm tense and relax as they wander around the next aisle. He looks away nervously. It was really so nice of Lizzie to invite me round to your place tonight. You know, when we ran into her earlier, she seems lovely. James chuckles, turns to face Charlie and starts walking backwards to hold his gaze. He flicks a strand of golden hair out of his eyes and glances briefly over to a row of olives. He quickly grabs a jar at random and drops it in the trolley then turn back to look intently at Charlie as they continue walking. Yeah, she's a good friend. Honestly though, her finding us probably wasn't a coincidence. I reckon she keeps a list of all the guys I ever mentioned to her so she can meet them or size them up, I don't know. I hope you don't mind. Eyes wide, Charlie suddenly stops walking and blurts out, here's uh, the salsa. He eyes the small plastic tubs pretending to pick out a dip. Without looking up, he mumbles, you mentioned me to your flatmate? I am um, in what context? James watches Charlie for a few moments and finally responds, oh, you know, that second, that we met the second day of term in that economics class. He steps forward and pauses in front of Charlie, close enough to see him catch his breath. Then James bends down to pick up one of the tubs and how when I came up to you to compliment you on your shirt, you blushed and mumbled something about a charity shop. James smiles warmly at the memory. He blinks twice and focuses his attention back to the boy in front of him. I was just surprised that you wanted to talk to me. Charlie smiles softly. Of course I wanted to. Not every day you see such a great shirt. James looks down at one of the plastic salsa tubs at the plastic salsa tub in his hand and gently squeezes it. He looks up at Charlie's dark eyes. You like it spicy? Thank you. 
that was a great story Madeline um absolutely loved it loved the kind of premise of the story as well so thank you so much um with that um so um just before I carry on as well um just to remind you that um everyone can put in questions to the Q&A and start populating it as well now and towards the end we'll have a short Q&A if we have time hopefully now um our next reader is the very talented uh, Amunawai Radia, um, and he's going to share some poetry with us. Um, so please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read out two of my haikus, and well, three of my haikus and one of my poems. So I'm going to start off with two haikus. The first one goes like this. Tap, tap, tap the screen. Boredom or entertainment, a millennial. Second haiku, arched back and bent knees, moving slowly, watching their gait, the elderly dance. Here's a, a poem that I wrote and it's called 80th Birthday. <clears throat> my knees hurt as he bounces on my lap, but the joy overrides the pain. My younger self stands before me, tall, bright, and strong, but with my wife's eyes. He smiles warmly, my son, and then, with the strength that I once had, scoops my jeans from my lap. My 80th birthday, I see my own life before me, an endless cycle repeating. And here's my final thank you. Full, ripe with flavor, dry and shrunken with flavor, grape versus raisin. That's me. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Iradia. Um, yeah, I absolutely love that. I love the imagery in everything that you've written actually in this. So um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing and giving us your time as well. Super. Okay, so um, we now have a reader, um, Chakshu Joshi, um, and she has a lovely short story about Dada and Dadi, and uh, a haiku, I think. It's nice to be shared, so go ahead, Chakshu. Thank you, Mo. Um, so this is a story written from the perspective when I was five years old. I clattered down the stairs loudly, happy to be out of my school uniform and into my matching pink tracksuit. It's my favorite outfit and I wear it especially for my daily walk with my dada and dadi. My dada and dadi are my dad's mom and dad, and they have come from India to stay with us for a few months, filling the house with new smells and lots of homemade food, like aloo baratas and kheer. Their cooking is so tasty, and they love seeing me eat, even more than mama. They are the most caring gentle giants in my small home, always ready to give a warm hug or a soft wrinkled hand to hold. Our days are filled with games and laughter, with quiet afternoons of naps and prayers. I love doing everything with them because it's my job to make them proud and show them my life here. Every afternoon after school, we go for a walk around all the houses in the area and into the park nearby. Sometimes I take my bike because Dada and Dabi walk so slowly. I feel like a superhero speeding past them. The whole way there, we sing old Bollywood songs into the cold winter air to keep warm. I like learning old Bollywood songs because it makes them happy. They sound sweet, but I don't really understand them. It must mean something really important because every time my dad or dad is saying, the other one claps and smiles and <laughs> says how talented the singers are. I also don't think dad and daddy like the weather here because they wear so many jumpers. When we go out, my dad puts his hat down so low and his scarf so high and wonder how he can see where he's going. I giggle at this idea while I shove my shoes on excitedly. I hear the sound of bangles clinking together and look up to see my daddy, but not in her usual jeans and cardigans she wears for our walks. She's still wearing her Indian clothes, uh, a pretty purple Punjabi dress with white patterns and silver jewels. It reaches past her knees and is worn with matching purple trousers. I love this dress of hers because it's my favorite color and, and it's daddy's favorite color too. Even though I love wearing purple, I can't understand why she's wearing that and walking to the front door. Isn't she gonna change? No one wears those kind of clothes here. I think of all the other kids in the park and picture them laughing at me because of the way she's dressed. 
I picture them being rude to my daddy and her getting upset like I do when people are mean. They're going to ask me questions that are going to make me feel like I'm stupid. I get hot inside and feel something weird in my stomach. All of a sudden, I don't want to go to the park anymore. I step in front of my grandma in the door. Without thinking, I blurt out, aren't you going to change? You can't go out like that. What do you mean, bitter? She says with a smile. For some reason, this makes me feel small and I can't find the words to speak. I stand in silence while she puts her shoes on. All the while, my heart is banging against my chest, making it hard to breathe. I begin to worry I have failed at looking after Dada and Daddy. My Dada comes and he moves me away from the door, laughing at me and my natuk, which is another word for drama. Usually I join in with the fun, but I can't stop thinking something bad is going to happen. He and Dadi step outside, telling me to come with them. <sighs> There's no going back now. I have to be strong and pretend everything is normal. I feel so shy and want to run away. Maybe that will stop everyone finding out I am Indian. I look outside to see my daddy smiling at me. Her dress looks so bright against the white houses. My eyes almost can't believe what they're seeing. I take a deep breath and walk outside, noticing how different everything feels. And this is my haiku. Alone we exist, looking up at bright white stars, dreaming of heaven. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chuck Shu. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I can, I, I think if I speak for other children of, you know, second generation British citizens, it's a story that we can all quite relate to. Um, and so thank you for sharing that. It was really heartfelt. Okay, so next, um, we have um, our last but not least reader, um, Darcy Frankiti, um, who has an amazing haiku relating to Aberdeen and uh, a short story. Um, called fairy tale. Go ahead, Darcy. Thank you, Mil. Um, my haiku is called Har. The har consumes coasts. Streetlights like lingering souls cling to vision's edge. And next, I'll read my short story, which is called Fairy Tale. Galahad was nearing the end of his journey. He could feel it in his manly bones. After years of constant journeying battling every terrifying man and monster that stood in his way and saving every damsel in distress he came across. There was only one more quest he had to complete before sealing his fate as a hero of the land. Step one, collect the staff of eternal isolation from the great wizard. Step two, use said staff to steal away the screeching wasp cobra that had been terrorizing the hungry marsh for the better part of three centuries. Step three, become a hero. This is what Galahad was made for, what he was destined to do. He had spent his entire life training and fighting and striving for this moment, and he wasn't going to let anyone or anything change his fate. As he approached the great wizard's tower, Galahad paused and took the time to study the impressive building while giving his aching feet a brief rest. Dark towers covered in purple ivy spiraled into the sky the tops of which were enshrouded in low-hanging clouds and appeared to be home to dozens of black birds. They swooped from turret to turret, rising high into the sky before bursting back down through the cloud belt. From this distance, the creatures could almost be mistaken for dragons by the untrained eye. But Galahad was very trained and had in fact fought some of his own dragons in the past, so he wasn't fooled by their appearance. Galahad galumphed his way down the hill towards the tower's entrance, his intricate armour clattering and the Sword of Triumph strapped to his back, bouncing as he went. He rocked up to the large, ornate door and attempted to push it open, but it wouldn't budge. It had been sealed with a locking spell. The Great Wizard was crafty indeed, but Galahad knew what to do. He looked up the tower's colossal face and readied himself with a courageous huff. The size of the structure was intimidating, but Galahad wouldn't let it affect his resolve. After all, he had seen taller towers made of darker stone. He turned to the purple ivy to the right of the door and gave it a forceful tug. It didn't give. With that reassurance, he began to climb up the side of the tower. After almost falling to his death three times and being attacked by a black bird, 
Galahad made it inside the great wizard's tower. The room he entered appeared to be a parlour of sorts. There was an assortment of furnishings covered in cauldrons, vials, and in instruments the likes of which he had never seen before. And that was saying a lot, considering Galahad had thought he had seen everything. It wasn't quite the dark magician's lair he had been wishing for, but he assured himself even someone who decorated their mahogany table with white lace doilies could still make a mighty fool. Suddenly, the door at the, end of the other end of the room slammed open and Galahad moved into a writing stance, hand itching toward the hilt of the Sword of Triumph that peeked over his broad shoulder. There he was, the great wizard in all his glory. The large pointed hat he wore cast a shadow over his face and his long grey beard tumbled down over his magnificent flowered apron. In his hands, he clutched a porcelain plate on which sat a rather scrumptious looking cake. You could have just come in through the front door, you know. Galahad froze at the sound of the wizard's voice, still standing wide-legged in a pose that didn't come off quite as heroic as Galahad had hoped. It's a pull door, not a push. People often make that mistake. The wizard meandered over to an empty cauldron and carefully balanced the cake on its rim. His hands finally free, the wizard pushed his hat back on his head and Galahad was greeted with the sight of cheery blue eyes and a wrinkly smile. He quickly corrected his posture and offered the wise and spellcaster an extravagant bow. Going through the formalities with which he greeted every stranger on his odyssey, he quickly and keenly introduced himself to the great wizard, kindly asked for the staff of eternal isolation and waited for the adoration that would most certainly come. And where are your papers? I, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, your greatness. Did you bring your documentation, your qualifications, proof of identity? The wizard was met with a blank stare and stunned silence. You don't even have a reference from your place of work. I work as a hero, I don't have any. Well, how am I supposed to know you are who you say you are? Here you come tumbling through my window, asking for one of my possessions and offering me nothing in return but a winning smile and a flash of your biceps. But I'm a hero, this is what I'm destined to do. I require your staff to vanquish my final adversary so I can gain the favour of my one true love, Princess Aurelia. Then we can get married and live happily ever after. You mean the Princess Aurelia of the ethereal kingdom? Yes, who else could I possibly be referring to? The wonderful, beautiful, enchanting Princess Aurelia. Every time I close my eyes, I can see her long platinum hair shimmering in the sunlight as though the stars themselves are woven into it. Her eyes, the colour of sweet honey, melt my heart, and the very sound of her name. Oh, I wouldn't bother trying it with her, the wizard interjected. I've heard her parents have already promised her to the queen of another kingdom. I think you best be sticking with someone more local. Maybe one of the barmaids down at the tavern. Or my lovely niece. She helps her mother run the bakery in Selmont. That's not far from here at all. And she makes the most wonderful lemon and white chocolate cupcakes. She did learn from the best, of course, he said, eyeing up the cake balanced on top of the nearby cauldron. Princess Aurelia is promised to another. The wizard heard a measly whimper emanate from the once mighty hero and shook his head before making his way over to comfort the poor oaf. After a few sympathetic pats on his muscular arm, the wizard started to guide Galahad too dismayed to notice towards the door. Perhaps all this hero business isn't for you, eh? It's not for everyone after all. Have you ever considered going down another career path? Galahad jerked his head up to meet the wizard's eyes, shaking his head wildly in adamant refusal. No, of course not. This is my fate. This is what I have to do, what I've been told I have to do for the longest time. That's what they all say, the wizard said wistfully. Now go on, you leave here. Go for a nice walk and clear your head. Maybe a more suitable job will come to mind. Galahad continued to stammer his protest, but the wizard wasn't having any of it. All thoughts of getting the staff were out of Galahad's head the moment he heard the parlour door slam shut. And for the first time in his life, Galahad was left to reflect on what he would do next. It was so sad, the wizard thought, that some people were so willing to brainwash individuals into believing they were the one saviour of all humanity. Galahad wasn't the first to visit him, and he was sure he wouldn't be the last. It was up to him to talk them down from their high and mighty state of mind. Some people just weren't meant to be heroes. 
It was a fact of life. It would be cruel for the wizard to encourage such delusional beliefs. How could he let them continue on in such a manner? It was the great wizard's destiny to stop a hero from rising to power. Men are so corruptible after all. That was, yeah, that was great, Darcy. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and it, the imagery was even better and the stuff, oh, I love it. I love the little kind of perspective from the wizard as well throughout. Thank you so much for sharing that. So that was the last um, kind of piece being read out by our lovely writers. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much to all the writers as well. Um, the Q&A is now open. I will be addressing any Q&A questions that have come through. Um, if you're struggling to find it, I'm sure you'll be able to um, put it in the chat as well if you can't find the Q&A and we might address some of those if I can read it, if that's okay. Um, we do have a question um, from Leanne Bodkin um, to all of your writers. Um, so lovely to hear you read your work. Are you still writing? So actually, it'd be nice to hear from everyone, actually, you know, are all of you still writing? What did you take away from this, uh, the course, really? Is anyone there? Hello? Is there anyone? Ah. Well, you can, you I'm can still confess writing. if you're not. You can confess. <laughs> I would say confess. Yeah. But you're really busy. Come on, us. Fess up. <laughs> we are all quite busy, aren't we? Uh, Chuck, are you still writing? Yeah, yes. Yes, I am actually. I've started again um, this year because of all the things I've been seeing on wards. It's a good way to sort of decompress, but it's, uh, it's something I would like to do a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is a good way to kind of, um, kind of get in touch to your human side again. So yeah, I haven't stopped writing since, um, albeit it is short poetry and stuff like that. And I haven't had a chance to really write a story, but yeah, I like the fact that it's kind of reopened the kind of creative dam. <laughs> How about you, GFA? are you still writing? Yeah, I still, and I think it's because of this uh, course actually that kind of inspired me to reboot my uh, almost dead block that <laughs> had left vacant for years and so yeah I've def I've tried to start writing like at least once or twice a month um I actually did write something yesterday about my GP placement and like a just a, a story an anecdote and it's just really good just even if no one reads it I feel like it's just a great way to kind of document like stories from my life that I just don't want to forget and I yeah. think ultimately that's you know why we should write really is for ourselves yeah and it's I guess it's a kind of way to kind of leave your mark isn't it and kind of if yeah. somebody comes across your writing in 20 30 years time 100 years time they go oh wow this person Chi Fei Lao she was writing pretty cool stuff about her time at med school um and yeah your reading voice is amazing actually um Thank you. yeah it's it's absolutely you know uh, brought your story to life and um yeah, it's better than I imagined it would be. So thank you again for sharing that. You know, maybe record some of your voice on and make a nice podcast. That'd be a nice way to... <laughs> it would be nice, like, um, children's bedtime story. That's... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's a dream. <laughs> 100%, 100. Are any of the speakers still here? How about the seniors, you know, uh, Omunua, um, or... You know, are you still writing? You know, or will we see more poetry coming from yourself? <laughs> well, actually, um, so I haven't been writing that much prose, but I do write music. Um, and definitely the whole experience with the creative writing really helped with my songwriting ability because it just, it just allowed me to, I used to get too stuck when I was writing music and like trying to make a rhyme and this and that, but I was actually able to start, you know, telling a story just as it is without being too focused on trying to make it 
you know, wine, things like that, just actually tell the story as it is, which, which has created more authentic, I, I think, more authentic, more real uh, songs in my songwriting process. So um, it's really helped me with that. So I have been writing lots of music, but not, not mm -hmm. that much poetry or prose. So maybe I need to um, do that again. Yeah. I I have heard some of the Yeah, I think I need a Dr. Lynch, like, because I the last one I loved about that class, the Dr. Lynch would be like, right, you gotta write this, it's gonna be about this, you gotta start writing and go. <laughs> yeah. And then it kind of forced it's really good. Yeah. to start something and just <laughs> go with it. And um, so I think I need that um that that boost of energy yeah. to get going again. As I as I keep saying to everyone as well, like one of my fondest memories in medical school is actually sharing and listening to other people's works at the end of the week. And it's just like, oh wow, okay, you went away and turned this kind of um brief into that story. And I came and went, and it's such a nice way to see like how people's minds work and how how actually everyone's a pretty good storyteller. I think everyone just needs to sit down and do it. I think that's just the that's the that's the main thing. And yeah, again, thank you, Dr. Lynch, for pushing us. <laughs> yeah super uh so i've got another question here okay so this is from Selkie, right i'm a midwife turned, turned writer i am writing more fiction these days but i keep going back to memoir can i ask the speakers what comes easier complete fiction or experiential prose or priority why do you write oh and why do you write i missed that so yeah, so anybody kind of, let's just break that down actually. So it's kind of split up into fiction or prose or poetry. What's your favorite and why do you write? I guess that's a summary of it really. So Karina, Kitty, what do you prefer? Connor, your stories are really good and your haiku is amazing as well. What do you prefer to <laughs> write with? I think I prefer taking like, as everyone said, with all the stuff that like you see on wards, it's nice to be able to write it down. But if you take those stories and then make it fiction out of that, I kind of like, because you're kind of taking something that might have happened that isn't quite pleasant for you, rationalizing it, and then just kind of making it your own. That's what I prefer, I think. Yeah, so it's kind of like exper experiential prose in that case, yeah. that kind of answers it. Um, yeah, that's, it's a good way to debrief and also keeping um, patient identity um, <laughs> um, intact as well. How about you, Karina or Connor? Whoever wants to. Um, yeah, I um, I think it's based on my memories, really, um, and encounters that I've had with people um that have given like a strong memory for me so I guess it's just fiction from my memory really I just exaggerate a little bit um of what I can remember if I can remember much um okay. I'm not good at poetry I really suck at poetry and my family haiku is really odd but it's quite funny to read so that's fair I mean isn't it uh it's that memories are subjective anyway so yeah I guess in a way everyone's who writes from memory is kind of writing fiction in a sense as well um yeah no it's nice though i love reading everyone's work as well and connor right uncle tommy is that fiction is it a bit of truth in there is it yeah there's a lot of embellishment i think um, yeah. and a lot of kind of i wonder if it went like this or what you know and trying to kind of um you know i guess maybe try and fictionalize some empathy as well and like trying to get in other people's heads and then I just kind of let that yeah. pick up pick up momentum I think um yeah and boy did I pick up momentum it really did it was good um and your haikus were pretty spot on what's your process for that <laughs> I think our course uh the, the month that the course fell on I think and uh, the state of my accommodation in third year was probably uh <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, that one was real life. That was definitely autobiographical. Yeah, and I, I and as I was editing and reading this, and um, like everyone's works as well, I'm seeing like the haikus were really, really good at kind of capturing the student experience. <laughs> if, uh, if that's the way for me to describe it, um, and also being a medical student and kind of being a medical student during COVID. You know, 
Um, but yeah, Bodkin's asked another question. What was the hardest thing about creative writing? F finding something to write about, structure, etc. I think it's like um, what Amonia said. It was just like a short space, like a short period of time where um, Helen would give you a kind of brief and you had to write to that brief and then stop because um, it's very much made you think like quite quickly on your feet um, and you didn't have time to edit it like I think medical students have that tendency to be a bit of perfectionist and there was nothing like that you just had to go with it go with the flow and then have the courage to read it out um, which was another um, another issue so yeah it was I think that was challenging but also allowing yourself to be completely free and not stick to structure um, and just go with the flow which I think can be quite difficult yeah I'm used to structures and following like boxes and how to separate things and classify things and make yourself sound slick so yeah it was nice it's nice break <laughs> I think yeah I think my takeaway from it was as well it's quite refreshing to be human <laughs> you know just kind of just feeling things and experiencing and just being able to share it with other people and being human really um, I see Madeline, do you have some of that? Um, I found the poetry a lot more straightforward um, because you can just write snippets of things. So I actually had a lot of trouble writing the longer pieces, maybe differently than Karina, you know. I would sort of write during the tutorial time and then stop and think, oh, I had finished it. So which is why a lot of the pieces that I ended up writing were about very small periods in time and I couldn't get any of the word counts to be very long or explain an entire story so that's what I struggled with was coming up with something that actually had a proper start middle and end yeah it is like it, I think it also kind of pertains to personality types as well like are you somebody who can sit and focus um yeah and I especially remember like on on the times that we'd have like half an hour like times to write something and I'll be like oh well there's so much time to kill like what I'm gonna write about but then I guess like when you do start writing it does sometimes just flow that's for me anyway um but yeah poetry is like is very refined and uh, controlled right so if um anybody's watching still there's loads of you actually still but like um that was just what we heard today was just a very small snippet of like the amazing works of these really you know talented people um who had um kind of speak today and kind of share their works so sorry long story short um the verbal remedies book this year is called Verbal Remedies, The Booster Shot. It's three years worth of amazing stories put into one nice little pamphlet. Um, and so we'd love for you to be able to get a hand on physical copy of this book. Um, and the proceeds of which will be going to a charity, um, which is uh, Mental Health Aberdeen. Um, and you can find them on mha.uk.net. Um, and they have very kindly offered to be distributors as well. So over the next uh, coming days, um, they'll be hopefully releasing how to order the book online and get it shipped to you wherever you are from Aberdeen itself. Um, and the charity themselves, they do really good work. They've been working with like um, supporting people with mental health, offering counseling from all ages, from teenagers and children all the way up to adults. And we believe like during COVID it's been yeah it's been challenging for a lot of us and so I think supporting um charities like this is just a good step forward to kind of helping everyone kind of get back to back to normal right um so yeah so if you follow them on Twitter it's MH Aberdeen um they'll have updates coming on and you can see the work that they do as well it's really good um and then I don't know if it's possible, but I'll try and email a link out once the online store is up as well. Um, and yeah, and it's just a small donation in return for a copy. Um, and then it'll be posted out to you from them as well. Um, so yeah, um, I don't think we have any more questions. 
So thank you so much to all of our readers. Thank you so much to um, <laughs> all of our viewers. Um, Leslie, amazing, once again, absolute hero. Um, signing in rapid speed <laughs> and how to explain but it's amazing thank you so much what you do and making the host um the event more accessible to so many more people so thank you so much um yeah so that's all from me um helen do you have any words to words to end on share no i just wanted to say i just wanted to say thank you very much ah there's my camera keeps going off <laughs> Obviously, I'm, obviously, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for 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 um, hosting and to Hannah sure. and to the media services team, um, and for the way we're team and events team at Aberdeen University, and again to Creative Scotland and all the sponsors and donors. Um, yeah, it's been it's been lovely to see you, and thank you ever so much for coming. And yeah, hope you'll hope you'll all go and get a copy of the book. So Mo, do people just have to Google this charity? What do they have to do? Yeah, so, so I didn't, I didn't follow that, but that yeah, so if they just go to the website maha.uk.net um and they will be having a little section where you can buy it online. And when they open up their store they'll have physical copies as well. Um, and we might be distributing copies on campus as well if mm -hmm. um if COVID permitting. <laughs> so super that's all, thank you. There it is. Don't miss oh, it. Oh, yes, and there it is. I didn't get it up because I don't want to <laughs> take the spotlight away from Leslie. <laughs> Super. Yes, thank you very much again to all our wonderful readers and, and to you, Mo. And yes, thank you very, very, very much for coming. It's It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you very much. A round of applause to everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>